whose responsibility is door knocking? Because I think this is a topic that is, a, is, is debated out there on whose responsibility is it to go, uh, to go soul winning and to, to knock the doors, to preach the gospel, whatever you want to call it. Now, if you were a Calvinist, then they would say it's God's responsibility, right? God's going to get it all done. He doesn't need us because even if we, even if we go soul winning or we don't go soul winning, they're going to get saved anyway. Um, and obviously, we believe that is false. Uh, I do not believe in Calvinism at all. In fact, I, I actually, the first church I went to was a Bible Presbyterian church. So I'm actually quite familiar with Calvinism and, and, and the five points of Calvinism. And I do not believe any one of those five points is true. Uh, so I'm not a Calvinist. I believe that God has done everything in terms of uh, getting people saved. And now it's our job. He's committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation to get the gospel out there. Now, let's, let's have a look at Matthew 28. Um, we'll just look at every time uh, the Great Commission is mentioned, because it's actually mentioned in um, all four of the Gospels, not in Luke, but the reason why they say that is because Luke wrote the book of Acts, and we see the Great Commission in the first chapter of Acts. But in Matthew 28, it says there from verse 16, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying... So Jesus is just talking right here to the eleven disciples. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power or authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And you know, one thing that's interesting, you know, how this says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. But how come there are missionaries out there just trying to reach one nation? You know, why, why if the goal, when Jesus said, go and teach all nations, why would you then say, well, I'm just going to teach one nation? I don't know why, but um, you know, it's pretty clear that, that God doesn't want the limitations being just one culture or one nation of people. He wants us just to reach everybody um, and not put a limit there. Let's go to Mark 16, uh, verse 14. So you see, afterward he appeared unto the eleven. So it's probably the same, very same uh, instance as they, as they sat at me. Oh, sorry, it's not the same instance because this is where they were eating here. The other, they were in a mountain. And upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name, of that believe, in my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Because Jesus was only saying this to the eleven, you know, we, we want to understand this passage well. And I'll get into whose responsibility is and how that applies to us. But when he talks about here the, the signs that will follow them that believe, I believe it's, it's only talking about these, disciples, these apostles here that, he's, that he was actually talking to. Um, and then that's why later on in verse 20 it goes, and they were went forth, um, the, the, the disciples that he was speaking to, and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. And, and my position there is, is because you know, back then they didn't have the whole word of God. You know, they were the ones appointed to preach the Word of God and also some of them to pen down the Word of God. So they don't have the Bible written as we do today and can't say, you know, it is written and, and go back to the Scriptures. And that's why Jesus gave them these miracles and these signs and these wonders to confirm that what they were preaching was the Word of God. Now let's go to John. John 20. 19 and this is where we see the commission given to the disciples in the gospel of john verse 19 in chapter 20 then the same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the jews came jesus and stood in the midst and said un saith unto them peace be unto you and when he had so said he showed unto them his hands and his side 
Where uh, then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord? Then said Jesus to them again. So it's interesting that there are different instances where he's telling them to go because it's almost like they, they weren't going and he had to keep telling them to, to, that this is what um, that they needed to do. Or maybe he was just, not that they weren't going because he asked them to wait for the promise of the Father, but he was emphasizing, hey, we need to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. So if God was just going to do it without us, why is Christ so adamant in telling his disciples, go and preach the gospel to every creature? This is what he says in verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And the last one, which we'll see from Luke uh, in Acts. And we'll just read a, a, bit, a bit of a larger portion here. And we'll just start from verse 1 in Acts 1. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. One thing I just want to point out there, it's interesting that you know, we often want to look at heavenly things. We want to often think about where we go when we die you know, and look to, to the heavenly Jerusalem, look to the future, to the coming of Jesus Christ. And this is what the disciples were doing there, right? They were, they were asking him. Um, you know, it, they said to him in verse 6, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Cause that, so they're looking for that, that, that future abode, right? That, that, that heavenly place that they're going to be. But what does Jesus do? What does Jesus direct them back to? He says, hey, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. So he's not saying it's not important, but he directs them back to their job here on earth. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So yes, we keep heaven and we keep the future in our foresight, but don't forget that we have a job here to do and that's to preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then return they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. So just note that, with the women. So the women are with them as well. And Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brethren, and in those days, P Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of the names together were about 120. So we see that there's, there's about 120 of them gathered in that room. So ho hopefully it was a large room. If we had 120 people in here, it'd be pretty crowded. Um, and they were all continued in one, in, in, in one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. So there were women there with them too. It wasn't just uh, the men. Now let's continue reading in uh, chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So this is all 120 of them, including the women. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. 
So note that it's sat upon each of them. So it's not just sitting up upon the men, is it? It's sitting upon the women as well, this, this promise of the Father that they were waiting for. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea, and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, saying one to another, what meaneth this? What's going on? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. So the third hour of the day would be what, nine o'clock in the morning, I think. But this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So a couple of things, I know we read a lot of Bible just then, but a couple of things I just wanted to point out in those uh, scriptures you know, in, in the previous passages, in John, in Mark, in Matthew, do you remember uh, Jesus, before he rose, before he ascended back into heaven, he gave them that great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, one thing I want to point out is, if this was the last thing that Jesus said before he left us, before he went up to heaven, don't you think that's something really important? It's something that we should emphasize. I mean, if that's the one thing he left his disciples with, saying, you know, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, you know, go ye therefore and teach all nations, and that's the last thing he said to them, you would think that's the one thing he wanted to leave you with. I mean, think about it. It's like when we, when we preach, generally the last thing you say is the last thought you want everyone to leave with, and then you finish. Well, isn't that the same with Jesus? That's like the last thing he's telling them and then he ascends up to heaven, you would think that's something very important and something that we need to take to heart. Now, num number two, you remember in Matthew and Mark, it was only said to the 11 disciples, wasn't it? Because only the 11 disciples were gathered there and when we're given the account of when Jesus said those words, it was only to the 11. And some people might say, well, the commission then was only to the 11 apostles. It wasn't just to everybody. Well, somebody might think that, but a couple of thoughts there is, you know, if it was only for the 12, then why did he say that you'd have to teach all nations, that you would have to go into the uttermost part of the earth? I mean, is that even possible for 12 to even do that in their lifetime if the commission was only to them? So I don't believe it was only for the apostles and that it was for those that would then follow in the footsteps of the apostles because Jesus is saying he wants everyone to know the gospel unto the uttermost part of the earth. But some people might say, you know, some people might say, um, you know, well, the responsibility is only for, you know, for men, you know, because it was only told to men. But we see there in Acts, and that's why we read that, that if, think about it, if Christ's uh, intention was for only men to go out and preach the gospel, why then when he said there, you know, wait for the promise of the Father, in Acts 1 here, I'll just go back there. He says, But wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And then when we go into Acts 2, we see there that the promise of the Father to baptize them with the Holy Ghost and to let them speak with tongues, it was given to the men and the women. So if God's, if Jesus' intention was just to send the men out to preach the gospel, why did the Holy Ghost come on the women as well? 
Why didn't it just come on the men? So it tells me that Jesus is not just limiting this work to the male gender, but he wants the females also to get involved in the work. And God has, has showed that, I believe, to us in Acts 2 by pouring out his spirit on the men and the women. And we see there the prophecy of Joel later on when Peter is preaching. He even says that this pouring out of the spirit, this promise of the father is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. And you can read that in Joel. It's very worded very similar. And it says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, verse 17, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I just want to quickly go to a couple of other places where you see uh, women preaching the gospel because I think it's great in our church that men and women preach the gospel and I think it is something that we are all responsible to do. Uh, look in Philippians 4, um, verse 1. We see Paul saying here in Philippians 4, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Yodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee, so I request of you, true yoke fellow, so fellow workers, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. So we see here that there were women that helped Paul preach the gospel. So it wasn't just helping him, you know, getting food ready or helping him, you know, uh, doing things around the house or uh, helping people and those things. And I'm sure they did, but he makes it a point here to help those women which labored with me in the gospel, preaching the gospel to people. Um, I just wanted to show you this other passage in Acts um, 21. Verse 8, And the next day we, we that were of Paul's company departed, and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. So we already see in that verse that, you know, Paul was sent to preach the gospel, but we can see here that, you know, Luke was part of that company. And he says here, we that were of Paul's company. So we don't really know how many people traveled with Paul, but there were other people that may not have necessarily been apostles traveling and doing the work that Paul was doing, preaching the gospel. And came unto Caesarea, we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist. So that's the same Philip from Acts 8, I believe, which was one of the seven. There we go. And abode with them. The same, and the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. So we see here that Philip obviously met those qualifications of being a deacon because you know he had four daughters which were virgins, so he obviously had taught them well, they had a good testimony. And they preach the gospel. They prophesy. They preach the word of God. So we can see here that it's not just for those 12, because if it was just for those 12, how could those 12 possibly on their own reach everywhere? And, and it's not just for men, because we see many examples in the Bible where women uh, preach the gospel. So the responsibility of soul winning is everybody's. It's every believer's responsibility. But I just wanted to uh, show you this from another angle as well, just to sort of um, support that view and if you have any questions about it you can always ask at the end for you men but let's look here at 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature all things are passed away behold all things are become new and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation so Paul is saying here that he's given us that that work that service of reconciliation. To wit. If you're wondering what to wit, does, any, does everybody know what to wit means? To wit means to know. You know, like, you know, like uh, in Acts where he says, I wot that through ignorance you did this. So he's saying, I know that you did this through ignorance. So when the Bible says waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body, it's saying we're waiting for that adoption when we will know, right, the redemption of our body. We'll get that new body. Um, so it says here, to wit, to know that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So he's committed unto us not only the, the work, but he's committed unto us the word of reconciliation. 
Now then we, as ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now I've often seen this verse where it says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, uh, be ye reconciled to God, saying, you know, we're all ambassadors. And I do believe that, don't get me wrong. But you just have to understand that I think in the context of this passage that Paul is not just referring to we as every believer because he's not including, I don't think he's including the Corinthian church, even though they're saved, in this we here. Now, we are ambassadors for Christ. I, I do think that he is talking about him and his company because he says in that same verse, we are ambassadors for Christ as, God, as though God did beseech you by us, talking about the Corinthians. Right? So if he's beseeching you by us, then how can that we include the Corinthians? Does that make sense? So in the proper context of this passage, I know we say we're all ambassadors for Christ, and I do believe that, and I'm going to go into that in a second. But just note that I believe that verse in the we are ambassadors for Christ, Paul is referring to him and his company being ambassadors for Christ to the Corinthians. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. So what Paul is saying there is being ambassadors for Christ, it's almost like God himself is beseeching you through us. And that's what God is doing when we go out and preach the gospel. Isn't that exciting? That God is using us to you know, pray that those people will be reconciled to God. Um, and and it's, it's almost as though God is doing it himself, sending us out there. So Paul is saying he's an ambassador for Christ. Right? And, 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 and it's his job. He, he's been committed the ministry of reconciliation. He's been committed the word of reconciliation. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 9, uh, verse 16. Look at what Paul says here. For though I preach the gospel, so Paul just talking about himself. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. So let's have that frame of mind when we preach the gospel. You know, we don't have anything to glory of. You know, we're just doing what we're asked to do. Um, it doesn't make us any better than anybody else, you know. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, saying I don't have anything to glory of because I have to do it. Um, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. So he's saying it, that's, it's very, very uh, sad if I don't preach the gospel because I'm commanded to do it. For, because if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is he saying there? He's saying if I do it because I want to do it, I'm going to get a reward. But if I don't do it willingly, God is commanding me to do it. I have to do it anyway. Um, so why not do it willingly and get a reward? But Paul is saying here that, you know, woe unto him if I preach not the, not the gospel, because he's saying necessity is laid upon him because he's commanded to do it. So we see here with Paul that he was committed the, committed the ministry of reconciliation, he's committed the word of reconciliation. He's saying here that it's necessary for him to preach the gospel. And some people might say, well, that was just Paul talking about himself. Right? That's not Paul, you know, this doesn't apply to every believer because every believer isn't Paul. That was just, you know, Paul, it was necess ne necessary for Paul because he was apostle, necessary to Paul because he was, he was committed the ministry of state reconciliation. He was committed the word of reconciliation. But think about this. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9. And I think this thought will tie it all together. And this is how I think we can show that it is truly what Paul applied to himself, applied to every believer. Verse 9, For I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. So what, what I think he's saying there, he's saying like, I think he gave us the short end of the stick, right? Because we're the apostles, but we're all going to die a martyr's death, um, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels and to men. He's like saying, we're, we're, like, we're like put on show. Uh, we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. 
Isn't it funny how that we get this frame of mind? I mean, we lift up the apostles and we're saying, these men are so great. Wouldn't it be great to have been an apostle? But here we hear from an apostle that it wasn't that great. He's saying, you know, we're appointed unto death. We made a spectacle unto the world. It didn't sound like they were living a very great life, were they? We are fools for Christ's sake, but year wise. So people think we're idiots, but they think that you're wise, that you, you, that you are smart. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. So back then, it was actually the apostles that were despised and rejected, and it was uh, others that were held in higher honor than them. Even unto this present hour, so even, even as he's writing this to the Corinthian church, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted, beaten, and have no certain dwelling place. We don't even know where we, where we stay tonight. And labor, working with our hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. Oh man, and see, none of us live like that. So when we think we've got it hard, you know, we've got to get, our, get back to the Bible and, and, and realize, hey, we don't have it that tough. So, you know, let's get to work and do something. Um, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. So he's saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying these things to you to make you feel bad. But as my beloved sons, I warn you. I'm just telling you this so that you're aware and that you know that these things happen. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Jesus Christ, I have begotten you through the gospel. Now look at this. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. So if somebody is saying, oh, you know, the ministry and the, the word of reconciliation are only committed to Paul, that it was only Paul's responsibility, you know, it was just necess necessary for Paul to do all these things. But everything that Paul did, he taught, right? And then he says here to the Corinthian church, I beseech you, he's saying, I, I'm begging you, be ye followers of me. Right? How many, and, and uh, another verse, I don't, I don't know if I'm, oh, I'll turn there later, but let's look at another verse in, um, uh, where did that go? First Thessalonians. Oops, that didn't work. First Thessalonians 1. Here's another passage. It says here, Paul and, Sil Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Now, I think that work of faith and labor of love involves preaching the gospel. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So he's saying here that their, their testimony um, says when it came unto them in much assurance, because you know how we were among you. So he's saying to the Thessalonians, you know how we behaved ourselves among you. And look at this. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord. So when Paul is saying, you know what manner of men we were among you, what includes that manner? That manner was that they had the ministry of reconciliation, that they had the word of reconciliation, that it was necessary for them to preach the gospel to every creature. That was his manner of life. And he's saying to the Thessalonians there, you know what manner of men we were among you. And he's praising them now and saying, and ye became followers of us. So he's praising the fact that they are emulating what Paul did and of the Lord. So it's not just that they were doing what Paul did, they were also doing what the Lord Jesus did having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Archaia. And look at this. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Archaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. Now, does it sound like that they were just preaching the gospel to friends and family? No, like I'm all for preaching the gospel to friends and family, but there's a necessity to get the gospel out to everyone. And here Paul is praising the Thessalonian church, saying, you knew what manner of man I was. You became followers of us. 
And your testimony was not just in Archa Archaea and in Macedonia, but every place your faith to God word is spread abroad. So that we, we don't even have to praise you in this. Other people already know what things you're doing. And this is the sort of church we want to be. We want not only people in Punchbowl and in the city of Canterbury, and that's why we put this word out on the internet, because we want everybody everywhere to know what is happening here and to be encouraged by it, just like Paul was encouraged by it uh, when he saw them do this. So let me ask you, if, it, if, if the necessity was only on the 11 or only on Paul, why then is Paul praising the Thessalonians for doing what they're doing and praising them for doing what he did, you know, and encouraging them to do that. Um, but let's look at a couple of others. And the reason why I'm coming at it from this angle is I think it's a bit more of a solid uh, stance on why every believer needs to be involved in the Great Commission. Because, you know, if you just say, well, you know, because Jesus taught us to preach the gospel to every creature, somebody might say, well, that was just for the apostles, right? So I think we have to add a bit more onto that to say and reason, you know, is this for every believer? And I believe it is. Um, here, what he says in uh, Philippians 3, uh, the Bible says here, Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an ensample. So Paul writes there under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he's saying, Brethren, be followers together of me. So do what I did. But he's saying, mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. So, but also note those people that are also walking like us and, and, um, and follow them as well. As you have us for an example. So he's saying, Paul set that example. He wants you to do as he did. And what did he do? He was an ambassador. He preached the gospel. He, he said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. That was the mentality that he had. And just one more on that point. 11. Uh, again, he says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. So Paul wasn't just commanding the churches just to eat, read, um, you know, fellowship, you know, Lord's Supper, baptism, because he says, Remember me in all things and keep the ordinances. So that tells me that there were more than just the ordinances that he wanted the uh, churches to do. 